Hallelujah, what a Savior. I do hope that you will vote on Tuesday. There's a little slip in your bulletin that tells you who the candidates are. There are also other candidates for offices like sheriff and county freeholder and so on, but these are the both Republicans and Democrats for the Senate and for the House of Representatives. And there's an interesting quote down at the bottom. If you don't vote in the primaries, you can't bellyache about your choices in the general election. <laughs> the primaries determine who's going to be in the general election. So uh, we encourage you to vote on Tuesday, two days from now. The Senate, two Republicans are running against each other, one Republican running for the House. And likewise, uh, in the Senate, the, there are two different Democrats running against each other and one in the House. So we encourage you to go out and vote on Tuesday. And if you're of age, you should be registered to vote. All right, please take your Bibles and turn with me back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a few moments ago over in the book of Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 15. And as you know, we're looking at the ten times that the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings. It's a very important lesson because we are told three or four times in the New Testament that those specific events were given to us as examples so that we'll know how to function properly in relation to the world around us, in relation to personal problems, and in relation to God who has given us directions for Christian living. These are our examples. That's why we're spending some time on it, because the New Testament makes multiple points out of these very events that take place during the wilderness wanderings and uses them as illustrations of what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do in the Christian life. Now, we've been looking at rebellion test number four because there are a lot of things in rebellion test number four that affect us, especially in relation to prayer and spiritual warfare, because that's really what rebellion test number four at Rephidim taught us, lessons about prayer and spiritual warfare. We learned nine basic lessons in spiritual warfare. Satan, the enemy, will attack you no matter what you're doing, but always will attack you when you're walking by faith. Just count on it. If you start walking with God, the devil is going to attack. So he wants to get you out of the center of God's will. Just be prepared for it. And it is not the appropriate thing to do to say, well, I guess what I'll do is I won't look for the center of God's will and then the devil won't attack me. No, you'll get something worse. You'll get spanked by the heavenly father. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. If you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are you bastards and not sons. So if, if you can get away with it, it means that you're really not one of God's children. You're faking it, and you need to trust Christ for salvation. That was the first lesson about prayer and spiritual warfare that we learned. The second was, as in most warfare, there's a division of assignments, different selections of troops, those who are sent to the front line as warriors, chain of command and logistical support, lots of different areas in relation to the division of assignments. The third lesson we learned was every subordinate officer must fulfill his role if there is to be victory. You know, if you have this great big huge computer circuit and it goes from one computer to another computer to another computer and spreads out to multiple other computers, if one of those computers is not working, if computer one works and it gets a two, and two works and it gets it to three, and three works and it gets it to four, and four is supposed to send it out to 15 other computers, and four is broken, the other 15 don't get it. No matter where you are in the chain of command, no matter where you are in the chain of authority in spiritual warfare, if you're not functioning the way that you're supposed to function, it affects somebody else. That's very important because every member of the body of Christ is essential. There are no irrelevant parts in the body of Christ. There are no evolutionary leftovers. And of course, the evolutionists have tried to make many different parts of the body evolutionary leftovers like the uh, tailbone and the appendix and so on. And then now we discover that these things have very essential functions in the human body. They are not irrelevant parts. They are not leftovers. And you are not a leftover when it comes to functioning in the body of Christ. Rule number four was headquarters have to, it must always be kept apprised of what's going on on the battlefield, and that's our communication with God through prayer. God has given you the privilege of prayer. You get to talk to the commander-in-chief. That's amazing. We don't have to go through 
a whole series of people here on earth and then the Pope, for example, gets to be the one that communicates with God on our behalf. We go directly to him. God listens to every soldier on the battlefield. Do you come to him on a regular basis to report in? That's what prayer is all about. You have the privilege of direct contact with the commander-in-chief. That's like having a hotline to President Trump. And when that phone rings, it doesn't matter who he's talking to. He may be talking to Mike Pompeo. Maybe he's talking to Kim Jong-un. Maybe he's talking to, you know, somebody else around the world. And when that line rings, he picks it up. Can you imagine having that kind of access? You have that access to the Heavenly Father. Direct access to God. The red hot line. And he picks it up every time. He never turns aside his children. That's an incredible blessing. Number five, we learned that there are always definite and doable steps in securing a victory. God never gives you a job you can't do. Did you know that? He never dumps something on you because he says, well, nobody else could do this, and I figure you can't do it either, but, you know, hey, you're here. So I'm just going to dump this one on you. Kavoomp! And you're sitting there, and you're crushed under this thing. You say, God, I can't do this job. I can't do this job. He says, do it. Hey, you know, you can do this. Well, I know you can't do it, but I gave it to you anyway. That's not the kind of God we have. God designed victory for you. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Every point of the battle where you are facing the enemy, God gives you doable steps to secure a victory. That's his promise. You say, well, then I just, I just sort of float through life and I guess I have victory. No, no. You have to take the doable steps that he gives you. And that's where the Bible comes in. You study the word of God. You're faced with a problem. You, you, you have a, a situation. You know, don't know exactly what you're supposed to do. You know what you're supposed to do? Well, you know what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to take this and find the answer. That's why you have daily Bible study. That's why you have daily prayer. That's why you come to services to hear the word of God preached. That's why you have interaction with other Christians. That's why you take books of theology and other Bible studies on specific issues and you pour over them because others have faced the same problem you face. There is no temptation taking you but such as is. What's the word? Come on. But such common, that's right. But such as is common to man. Every problem you ever face in life is a common problem. That means there have been other people who have fought that same fight that you're fighting, who've gone through the same deep waters that you're going through, who have suffered the same thing that you're going through. And as they have poured out their hearts before the throne of grace and as they have studied the word of God and as they have gotten counsel from their pastors and from others and as they have begun to study different passages against different passages, God has given them some solutions and they've written it down and it's available for you. There is no room in the army for slothful Christians. There is no room in the army for slothful Christians. God has given us, in this country especially, the most incredible resources for knowing how to do battle. You have 2,000 years of believers who have gone before you, who have stood in your shoes and faced the same foes that you have faced and done battle with the same temptations that you're doing battle with right now, and they have won. 
God never puts anything on you that somebody else has never faced. And he always makes the way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. Never say, it was too strong for me because it wasn't. Never say, as the so-called comedian said, the devil made me do it. No, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit. You have the Word of God. You have eternal salvation that can never be taken away from you. You have a God who listens every time you pray. You have a God who is available for personal help and personal consultation through his word anytime you want it, night or day, 24 hours a day. That's the most incredible set of resources that anyone could ever imagine. You've got the word of God. Number six was that we learned you can't make up your own rules for spiritual warfare. <laughs> Too many people try to make up their own battle rules and they always lose. We saw that lifted hands in scripture is a symbol of intercessory prayer. So with prayer there is victory, without prayer there is defeat. We learned another reason why you pray for those who are leaders in the church, because leaders get tired too. We remember that nobody is exempt from spiritual warfare faced by this church. You're part of this church, so you're part of the attack that comes against this church. Individuals may get credit for the victory, but victory is actually a team effort. I can't do it without you, and you can't do it without me. Every one of us is on a team. Every one of us is going to have to carry the ball at some point. Every one of us is going to hand off the ball to somebody else at some point. Every one of us is going to block for somebody else at some point. Every one of us is going to be like the, the medic that goes out on the field when a, a player is down and, and helps carry him off the field and bandage him up. We are a team. This church is a team. It is a team effort. Never think that you're individually not important or individually you can throw somebody else away. God put us here, every one of us. Not one of us is here by accident. Remember that. Not one of us is here by accident. It's not just because, well, we grew up in this church. Our parents came to this church 45 years ago, and so we're here today. Who put your parents in this church? Why were you brought to this church at a specific period in history? Maybe it was all the way back in 1941 or 45, or maybe you came into the church at 52. Uh, maybe you came into the church in 1961. Maybe you came into the church at 2011. It, it doesn't matter when God brought you in here. He brought you here to hear a specific series of messages, to interact with a specific group of people, to demonstrate Christian love and compassion, to be part of this church as it tries to reach the dark world around us for Jesus Christ. He put you here to be an encouragement to the other soldiers. He put you here to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. He put you here because you are needed here. This is just a small platoon of soldiers in the massive war against God that's been going on for centuries and for millennia and your key. Don't ever forget it and never give up. Never give up. Never give up. Spiritual warfare. That's what Rephidim teaches us. We are a team. We also learned that you can't ignore any part of your spiritual armor. And part of that, as we saw in Ephesians 6, as we were comparing that with Rephidim over in the book of Exodus, is you can't ignore any part of the armor. That means you don't downplay the essential need for individual and corporate prayer. Soldiers don't fight alone. Soldiers fight in an army. We learned that every soldier will face specific soldiers from the enemy's side in hand-to-hand -hand combat, so you need to fight side by side so that you're not overwhelmed by multiple enemy at once. 
When soldiers fight, they fight at the same location at the same time. And that's the point of the church gathered for prayer at prayer meeting. It's one of the major ways in which we fight the spiritual darkness around us. We learned that there are at least three guaranteed serious consequences for the kind of soldier who refuses to come to battle and is always late for the battle. Number one, you put your fellow soldiers at risk of death and risk the safety and defeat of the larger units. Number two, you put yourself at risk of death. God kills people. Did you know that? Did you know that God kills people? He takes soldiers off the field who are not fighting the fight they're supposed to be fighting. Church at Corinth is a good point in case. Today we're going to be taking the Lord's table. I'm going to be reading you from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 when we get to that point. Paul said there were some of the people there in that church that were really dilly-dallying around, really living carnally, really weren't in fellowship with him. They were coming to the Lord's table, they were getting drunk. Some of them were gluttonizing. Some of them were snatching food before other people could get it. Those are just illustrations. There's a lot of other different kinds of sins in the New Testament, too, where God killed people. Ananias and Sapphira, they lied about what they gave. God bumped them off. People, when you're not fighting a good fight of faith, remember, you put yourself at risk of death. When you are the kind of soldier who is the Mickey Mouse, you know, once a week, Sunday morning only kind of soldier, and you do nothing about it during the rest of the week, you put your fellow soldiers at risk of death. You put at risk the safety and defeat of larger units. You put yourself at risk of death because you are a highly visible open target. The devil looks for people like that. Number three, you put yourself in serious jeopardy with your commander in chief because you are willfully refusing to follow orders. Now, of course, knowing theology is irrelevant unless there's application, and the application is God put you here to protect the other soldiers in the church, so you need to be here for prayer meeting on Wednesday evening. Back on May 6th, we started looking at the fourfold division of the angelic military divisions that the Apostle Paul mentions here in Ephesians chapter 6. He talks first about the principalities, the RK, the first ones. That's used by Paul of angels and demons who are invested with power. Our saw our key verse was Romans 8:38, which tells us that even though you've got the biggest demons out there against you, you are safe. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? For I'm persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, that's our K, that's the first ones, that's the highest level, the echelon of angels and demons. Nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things could come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are secure. When you go into battle, you are eternally secure. The second key verse that we looked at was 1 Corinthians 15, 24, which told us that Jesus is more powerful than the most powerful demons and all of them put together. Then cometh the end, when he shall have put down, delivered the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall put down all rule, that's our key, and all prince authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. In Ephesians 1.21, we learned that the resurrection and the ascension are what guarantee that Jesus is greater than the greatest demons, greater than all of the R.K. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 20, which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead, there's the resurrection, and set him in his own right hand in the heavenly places, there's the ascension, far above all principality, R.K., there's our word, and power, and might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, it covers the scope of all of eternity past, all eternity future, time present and history, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. We saw in Ephesians chapter 3 that God is teaching wisdom to the angels by the way in which he is dealing with the church. To the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Now when we looked at that verse, which was three weeks ago, 
uh, it mentions down in verse 15 it says of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named and I said now you want to figure out how many times the word family is used in the New Testament and um, we had various guesses of different amounts this is the only place in the New Testament where the word family occurs that should make it rather significant because it's talking about a specific family for this cause I bow my knees unto the father of our Lord Jesus Christ of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named it's the family of the father through the Lord Jesus Christ that folks is your real family those are the ones you're going to be spending eternity with those are your brothers in Christ those are your sisters in Christ those are your fathers and mothers in Christ those when you lead others to Christ are your children in Christ that's our family in Colossians 1:16, Jesus created even the highest levels of angels before they fell and became demons he's their creator too Colossians 1.16, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether it be thrones or dominions or principalities, there's our word, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. That's why they can't beat him. He's their creator. In Colossians chapter 2, we see it used in verses 10 and 15. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's Jesus. He's God in the flesh. One of the key verses, you ought to have it memorized, Colossians 2, 9. Key verses on the deity of Christ. If anybody challenges you and says the New Testament doesn't teach the deity of Christ, take it to Colossians 2, 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's the deity of Jesus Christ. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. He's the top. No one bigger, no one greater, no one more powerful, no one with more authority than the Lord Jesus and you're in his army verses 14 and 15 blotting out the handwriting of ordinance this is where we left off last time uh, of ordinance that was against us it was contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing it to his cross remember that was where the accusation against a prisoner was nailed at the top of his cross and the accusation for which Jesus was condemned and crucified Jesus of Nazareth the king of the Jews We had an ordinance that was the handwriting against us too. Christian Spencer. Name every sin that God lists. And I did it, at least in my thoughts. And that was nailed to my cross that would send me to hell. And yours too. Because your thoughts and your words and your attitudes and your motives counts as well as your actions. Today we're going to partake in the Lord's table. The memorial of the sacrifice for all sin. And friend, you, as well as I, you have also committed them all. There's not one sin that's listed in the Word of God that you have not committed. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. Not sick in our trespasses and sins. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. And he took all that list of sins that was nailed above us for which we should have been thrown into hell and he nailed it to his cross. What an incredible graphic picture. That's what he was dying for on Calvary. That's why we remember him at the Lord's table because he could cry. It is finished! Praise God. 
And that's why it says in the very next verse, He spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. When he nailed my sins to the cross, he triumphed over the biggest demons in the entire universe. They couldn't do anything to stop him. Praise God. We saw that that word is also used of humans who are ordained to governmental power and authority. He writes to Titus, Paul does, to put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing meekness unto all men. Now that brings us to our second word here in Ephesians chapter 6, which deals with the echelon, excuse me, of authority and powers, the army military command structure that Satan has, and which God has in the angelic realm over the holy angels too. And the second word is authorities. Principalities and authorities. This is exousia. It's translated powers, but it means authorities or jurisdictions. A jurisdiction is an area where authority is exercised. And the one who has that authority only has authority in that particular jurisdiction. For example, if you drive through rural Alabama, which I have done on many occasions, every now and then you, you pass a little sign on the side of the road that says, police jurisdiction. Now everything past that sign, you're not inside a city limit yet. You won't be inside a city limits for another mile and a half. But you pass that little sign, police jurisdiction, and it says, the police in that little tiny town have jurisdiction all the way out there before it starts being the county sheriff. So it's an area, a jurisdiction is an area in which those who are legally authorized can exercise their authority. The same thing is true with these, this word exousia here. The authority and jurisdiction of the Lord Jesus Christ extends over everything. But within human and angelic realms, there are certain realms where humans have authority and there are certain realms where both angelic beings on the good side and angelic beings, we call them demons, on the bad side can exercise their authority. It's been designated for them. They don't just sort of willy-nilly scatter around. I mean, they pass information between jurisdictions, but, but each one of these demonic forces has jurisdiction. There's a demon or demons, multiple I'm sure here in Collingswood, multiple here in Collingswood, that have authority in this particular area. They have to keep track of what's going on here. They can't take vacations to Hawaii. They have to keep track of what's going on here in Collingswood. That's what this word means. It's the scope of authority. And with Jesus, this is the word where frequently we see the scope of his authority is frequently challenged. Not his ability. They could see his ability. They questioned his authority to do things. And that's where you find the use of this word exousia. For example, Matthew chapter 9. We see it in verses 6 through 8, but I'll read you the whole passage beginning in verse 4. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk? Now, here's the first use of our word. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power. The word translated power there is exousia. That means authority. And it's going to tell you the jurisdiction. He has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up thy bed, and go into thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. Now, if Jesus didn't have authority to do it, the miracle wouldn't happen. He had to have power. He had to have dunamis, which is another of the words that we'll look at later on. But he had to have the authority to be able to do that in that jurisdiction, which is on earth. When the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given such and here we have it again, power, that's exousia, authority unto men. They didn't get it. Why did he have that authority? Not merely because he was a man, but because he was God. You know, as you go through the Gospels, you see that 
Many times people are amazed at what Jesus does. And if they have no clue as to why he was able to do it, or the purpose behind doing it, or that it was one of the prophesied messianic miracles in the Old Testament. And Jesus is doing it all the time, all around them, and they're going, duh, ooh, that was, that's like going to the circus. Over in Philadelphia right now, there's the, the Big Apple Circus is going on, and people are doing all kinds of cool tricks, and everybody is jumping up and down and clapping and eating cotton candy and walking home and forgetting it. It was like that with Jesus on earth. To them, most of the people, it was like a big circus. Did you know that exousia, that's an authority that can be delegated? We see that over in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power, that's exousia, against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Jesus can delegate that authority in a specific jurisdiction. And he did that with the apostles. We see over in Luke chapter 5, verse 17, it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. <laughs> Jesus has got a hand-picked audience here. These are the groups that are going to try to find what is wrong with him. We've got to find a niche. We've got to find a loophole. We've got to find a weak chink in the armor. We've got to find something where this guy maybe is just doing magic tricks. Let's all of us get together. You watch him from this angle. You watch him from this angle. We'll be up on top looking down at him. You guys, you know, sort of lie on the ground and look up a little bit. See if you can see how he's doing his tricks. Came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. They were shoving out the regular crowd. And the exousia, the power of the Lord, was present to heal them. It's an authority that can be examined and always to be found with Christ, to be legitimate. This word exousia is also used of human authorities over certain jurisdictions as well as demons who have been assigned by Satan over certain jurisdictions. Listen to what Jesus says in Luke 12, verses 11 and 12. And when they bring you into the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, that's exousia, take ye no thought, so those are rulers on earth, and they're going to be doing some bad things. Listen. Take ye no thought of how or what thing you shall answer or what you shall say, for the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. You're going to be pulled before some people. He's not talking about angelic beings. You're talking about human beings, synagogues, magistrates, and powers. The Holy Spirit will teach you what to say at that time. You don't have to say, oh, man. I failed Theology 101, and I don't remember what's the answer to that question. <laughs> Holy Spirit will bring to your mind and mouth, if you're willing to say it, have the courage to say it, or willing to suffer for Christ, what you ought to say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. Now, we've already seen when we looked at principalities, no angelic or human authority can separate us from the love of Christ, just like no principality can separate us from the love of Christ. And we see that same word. It's the second word after principalities. I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers, that's exousia, nor things present nor things to come, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord. The word exousia also refers to spheres of jurisdiction as well as to the demonic spheres of jurisdiction. There are legitimate spheres and there are demonic spheres. There may even be spheres that are persecuting Christians, and yet they have legitimate authority. Now, what does legitimate mean? Let's, let's define that a little bit. Legitimate means supported by or authorized by law. But remember, just because something is legal, this is a, a principle you've got to learn. Just because something is legal does not make it morally right. Hear it again. Just because something is legal does not make it morally right. For example, abortion is legal. It is not morally right. In the eyes of God, it is murder. Physician-assisted suicide 
is legal in many states now, but that does not make it morally right to kill the patient. Gay marriage is legal, but that certainly does not make it morally right. For example, Satan can give exousia. He can give legal authority. And he does give legal authority to the Antichrist. And by the way, as we go through this passage, it's out of the book of Revelation, there are three key elements to exousia, and all three of them are listed in this passage here. So I'm going to read it to you, verses 1 through 7 of Revelation chapter 13. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. You say, whoa, who is it? Got to come Sunday evenings. We'll be talking about Revelation 13 in about 27 years, I think. <laughs> we'll get down there. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Now, in this phrase is where we have our word exousia. Uh, a, a different word, we have the word dunamis, which is force. It's not the word exousia here, where it talks about power. It says the dragon gave him his power. That's dunamis. That's the word force. We'll talk about that later. And his seat and great authority. But force, dunamis, the strength to do something, is often connected with the authority to do something. It does you no good if you have authority but don't have any ability to enforce it. So it says, The dragon gave unto him his dunamis and his seat and his great authority. Now we're going to find three levels of authority or three areas of authority that come under this ability to do it. I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and the deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon. Now, the dragon is Satan, I'll give you that much, which gave power unto the beast. Now, the word power there is exousia. The dragon gave authority to the beast. So the first element that we learn is the source of authority. There has to be a source for authority. The dragon gave authority unto the beast. That's the first thing. And they worshiped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and exousia, power, was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That's two and a half years. So the second element that we learn is time. Authority has to have a source. Authority, exousia, is for a period of time. That's the second element. Verse 6, and he opened his mouth and blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power, that's exousia, power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. That's scope. So you learn three things about exousia here. You have source, you have time, you have scope. How far does it extend? And here it's going to extend over the entire earth, over all kindreds and tongues and nations. You know, Jesus Christ is about all principality and power and dominion and might. Every name that's in heaven and earth and under the earth. Someday, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every knee. And they say, boy, we're talking about some pretty powerful demons out there. You're right. These passages I've just read you tell you how powerful they are. There's going to come a time when the entire earth, there's going to be force, there's going to be a source of power, which Satan is the source, there's going to be a three and a half year period of time, and there's going to be a scope which covers every language, every nation, every kindred, every tongue on the entire face of the earth. But Jesus is still Lord, and he has defeated Satan at the cross. Remember that. Jesus is your commander-in-chief. But you have been called to do spiritual battle. That's what all this is about. We've been talking about Rephidim. 
We've been talking about prayer. We've been talking about spiritual warfare because that is the illustration that is given to us of what we are involved in today. Are you a soldier who practices with his sword? You know that in our military today, they don't use swords. But you know they do learn how to do hand-to-hand -hand combat. If you go into Green Berets or into Special Forces, Delta Forces or things like that, uh, you know you learn to do hand-to-hand -hand combat. You learn to use a knife. You learn to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the enemy. To have him where you've got the knife up against his throat and he's trying to put his knife up against your throat. You learn to throw him and get it into his back. All of them learn how to shoot their rifles. And you know what? They all practice every day. They do target practice. They crawl through the, through the mud on their bellies while cannon fire is going over their heads just six or eight inches above their heads. Machine guns are strafing out and hitting dirt in front of them as they try to crawl to the side. And they use live ammunition. People, you're in a war. You had better learn to use the only offensive weapon that God has given to you to fight the battle because you are under attack whether you want to admit it or not. But be, praise be to God, you have the victory through Jesus Christ. Don't be like the church at Corinth or when the came to take the Lord's table. God said, some of you have been working out. Some of you have been living for the flesh. Some of you are involved in all kinds of horrible things. You read the first few chapters of 1 Corinthians, you wonder how God even left anybody alive in that church. I mean, they had every kind of sin that you could imagine going on in that church. And God in his mercy only killed some of them. You're about to partake of the Lord's table. I hope that you have been exercising with your sword. I hope that you have been in constant communication with headquarters through prayer. I hope you've had each other's backs and are supporting each other and helping each other up when another brother or sister has been wounded. You're helping those sand. You're playing the part of a medic, getting them out of the front lines so they can be treated. Are you ready for taking the Lord's table? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Though many would be ashamed of us if we were their people, yet our Lord Jesus Christ still loves us, and we are his people. And we're gathered here to partake of his table as he commanded, not as he requested, not as he suggested, not as he gave one of many options. But he commanded us, this do in remembrance of him. His death was for sin. He took that gigantic scroll of sins which we have committed. He took it out of the way and nailed it to his cross. He died for every one of those sins that we all have committed. We come here because of the blood of Jesus. We come here because he has paid it all and there's nothing we can do to add to it, subtract from it, or change it in any way. Father, I pray that you'll take your word as it has been proclaimed today, that you'll use it in each of our hearts, to the glory of Jesus Christ, your Son.
For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. In preparation for the Lord's table, let's take our hymnals and turn to number 413. Break thou the bread of life. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. Hymn number 413. We'll stand to sing.